Okie dokie. Hi, everyone. My name is Judy Younger. I am a librarian at Brookdale Community College, and I am so pleased to have Professor Jane Semeca here with us today to give this talk about Geraldine Thompson. I heard her give this talk through the Monmouth County Public Library System, and I just loved it so much that I thought everybody at Brookdale um, should hear this talk because it's so relevant to our Brookdale Community College, but also Geraldine Thompson is such a fascinating um, person in her own right. So let me just give you a little bit of introduction about Professor Semeca, and then we will move on with our uh, talk here. Um, Professor Jane Semeca teaches at Brookdale Community College where she holds the rank of Professor of History. She earned a master's degree in history and graduate certificate in women's studies from Rutgers University. So with that wonderful introduction, I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Jane Semeca. Take it away, Jane. Thank you so much, Judy. It is my great pleasure to share this information about Geraldine Thompson. I've actually got really interested in researching her because of Judy, because Judy shared some ideas with me um, when I was teaching about Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and she shared with me a column that Eleanor Roosevelt wrote where she mentioned Geraldine Thompson. And that sort of got me started on trying to find out more and more about Geraldine Thompson and her connection to Eleanor Roosevelt. So thank you, Judy. And I also, you know, I also have to say that I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all the librarians all over the county and at Brookdale who have been so generous in helping me to dig and find information during a pandemic <laughs> uh, about Geraldine Thompson, while the many of the libraries, of course, are closed and not really open for research. So I, I owe everything to the librarians who are just the best and make the work of historians possible. So thank you to all the librarians. So uh, Geraldine L. Thompson is uh, often referred to as New Jersey's first lady. And that's why the title of this talk is Geraldine Thompson, New Jersey's first lady. Uh, I'd like to start off with this slide because this is a picture of Geraldine Thompson in her young years. And uh, I, I find this to be a very fascinating photograph because she's probably, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 years old in this uh, picture. And she was about five foot four, blue eyed, strong chin. And I find this gaze at the camera to be both compassionate, kind, but determined. You know, she sort of represents to me in this photograph, um, her personality really shines through. And I see her, her determination and her energy, as well as her kindness, I think, that really shows through this early photograph of her from about 1919. So she was born in 1872 and she died in 1967. So she lived a very long life, 95 years. Uh, so what are we gonna do during this talk? I am going to describe her life and her work and especially the leadership that she provided. And I want to place her in historical context. Um, I've read a lot about her over these last few months and she has never really been placed in history. And so I think it's really important for us to understand her as a product of her time and where she fits into the historical story. I also wanna emphasize her local impact, that she had an enormous impact on Monmouth County and on the state of New Jersey, as well as on the United States in general. Her, her, na her nationwide profile and impact is also pretty surprising. And so we'll talk a bit about that. I'm also going to make the argument that she is the one of the most important people in New Jersey history. And she really deserves that title, New Jersey's first lady. And you know, it may seem a little bit extreme or a little bit going a little too far to call her New Jersey's first lady, but I think that I can make the argument that she does deserve that honor. So when I started doing this, 
work on her, I first started by looking in encyclopedias, right? In the, in the New Jersey Encyclopedia, which is a, a very, you know, thick volume that was done in the 2000s and about 2000, they published the New Jersey Encyclopedia. I looked up her name, she's not there. So I was really surprised that uh, somebody who had done so much was not in, not did not have an entry. And then I went to my women's, New Jersey women's encyclopedia. Surely she must be there among the great women in New Jersey history. No entry there either. Where is she? And so one of the things that I realized is that she's been overlooked. That while she was very well known locally and on state level, historians have overlooked her and have not really examined her in a historical context. And I'd even say that um, the many newspaper articles that were published on her throughout her life all pretty much say the same thing. And it's very two-dimensional. I have to say, after a while, I can't really read any more newspaper articles about her because they just say the same thing over and over again without any depth. Very two-dimensional, very thin. We are going to remedy that. And so that is part of what I want to do here today is I want to fix this problem of her absence in history and her and the way that she's really been neglected by historians. How can we get to know her? How do we get to know anybody in history, right? How do historians bring people to life? Well, we are going to try to look at her personal life as well as her career. Uh, so we'll look at her from the personal side as well as from her professional accomplishments. And when I teach women's history, and I've been teaching women's history at Brookdale for over 25 years, I always emphasize with my students that we need to look for women's own words. That it's really important for us to see how women describe themselves, describe their own point of view, their own, uh, how they feel about the world around them, instead of relying on how men view them and how they are described by others. So I was really interested in doing this research on trying to find as much as possible how she sounded, how she expressed herself and her, um, her point of view about her work and her life. I was able to find a, a number of good quotes from her in, uh, in newspaper interviews and things. So I have incorporated that into this presentation so that we get her words, we get how she describes things. The other thing is important, I think, to get to know her is remember, we are 20th century people and she lived until 1967. So, you know, we might have put some assumptions on her. Is she a 20th century person? I'm gonna argue that she's not. That her point of view, the way that she looks at the world, the way she views womanhood is very 19th century. That when I say she, the way she views womanhood, I'm trying to say that she sees the role of women in society, the role of women in their interactions with each other, in the family, as well as the networks that she worked in, clubs and different organizations. She has a very 19th century sensibility. And so we're gonna talk about putting her in history with her 19th century brain, her 19th century worldview. She also comes from an extremely privileged background and her wealth, her prominence, the kind of people that she grew up with and knew her whole life are extremely aristocratic. And uh, so that also shapes her. Uh, the, the life of privilege that she was always exposed to is a really important way of understanding how she views the world too. That being said, the people of her generation and of her social class took a, re a real responsibility for leading and helping others. 
that she believed that it was her duty to lift up the less fortunate, to serve people, to help others who needed it. And so even though she came from a privileged, wealthy background, she thought that that made her responsible for helping others. And so that is part of her worldview. She also felt that by working to help people in society, that it was an important part of making democracy stronger. She looked at it as a patriotic duty as well, that by helping the less fortunate, to helping people who needed it, whether that be through public health or prisons or orphans or education, that by helping people in society, that she was actually strengthening American democracy. So she looks at it as a patriotic duty. And so one of her dear friends, Miriam Van Waters, wrote uh, her obituary, a obituary for her that was published in the Framingham News in September of 1967. And as part of this uh, obituary, she really talked about how Geraldine Thompson was an American hero. And she wrote, quote, her primary concern was for the individual. She believed that we cannot have a better world until those who attain leadership humbly recognize their responsibility to give dignity to every human being. So even Miriam Van Waters, who had been her dear friend for over 40 years, describes her as someone who would always help others, who felt that it was a incredibly important duty of her class, of her Christian belief. She was a, uh, a very devout Christian. She was an Episcopalian who taught Sunday school and read her Bible and was uh, a, a very moral and Christian individual, attended uh, church. And um, she also um, believed in this idea of Christian leadership, right? That this idea of leaders who serve as part of her, of her personality. Um, so she believed in this idea of the dignity of every person. So much of her work is rooted in her personal development. So let's go start with the family. So let's start, what's the family business? Social work. <laughs> so Geraldine Thompson, had a 50 year long career in social services. And how does she get interested in it? Well, it's the family business. And what I mean by that is her grandmother was uh, Geraldine Livingston Hoyt. So she's named for her grandmother. And her grandmother was a uh, major influence on her. Um, she, was uh, a in New York. She was a member of the State Charities oh, Board in New York. And uh, she would go, uh, she would take a, a, a boat across the river to Randall's Island and would uh, help the inmates at Randall's Island Prison. She worked to remove the mentally ill from the New York poor houses, and she really worked to establish mental hospitals, very much like Dorothea Dix did in this same time period. We have to understand there were no institutions in the United States. Everybody was housed and incarcerated together. So prisoners, poor people, orphans, mentally ill people, all just thrown together and housed and incarcerated together. So women, uh, especially after Dorothea Dix really brings this to, uh, to everyone's attention, work, women work very hard to try to end this practice and to help the people who were 
being in custodial care like this. So to help mentally ill people or poor people who are being housed with criminals and orphans all thrown together, men and women together, children in there. So she was very much a, um, an advocate for social reform. And she was one of the founders of the social services department at Bellevue Hospital in New York. And she was an enormous influence on Geraldine Thompson. Also her mother and Geraldine Thompson's mother, here she is, was also a reformer who worked to establish a training school for nurses at Bellevue Hospital. So when I say social services is the family business, it's how she is uh, influenced by her mother's work as a reformer and her grandmother. Her sisters are also really influenced by the family business. Her two sisters are really interesting also who are active suffragists. They were um, Ruth and Margaret were her two sisters. Both were very active in New York politics, in temperance to outlaw alcohol, and in uh, New York suffrage. Uh, one of my favorite things that I read in doing research was the New York Times article about her sister Ruth's funeral. When her sister Ruth passed away, they had this big funeral in New York City and Carrie Chapman Catt, who is the head of the National Women's Suffrage Association is there. It, the, the list of guests at this funeral is like a who's who. Um, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mother is there. I mean, it's just her, her family is very prominent, but also are very well known for their good work. And so her sisters are, are quite interesting also. So Geraldine Thompson is a, we said New Jersey's first lady, but she was born in New York. So she starts her life actually in New York City. She's born in New York, actually in one of the old Astor homes up in the uh, 33rd Street in New York City. But then she lives and lives in this, uh, this beautiful uh, mansion in Washington Square. And she spent the summers in the Hudson Valley in this home on Strat in Strasburg, New York. And she, this, ho this home in Strasburg, New York came to her family through her mother's side of the family. Uh, her mother's side of the family were Livingstons, Geraldine Livingston Thompson. Uh, her mother's family were the Livingstons, which are a very prominent uh, colonial family. Uh, the Livingstons were colonial governors when New York and New Jersey were part of the English empire and were signers of the Declaration of Independence as well as uh, prominent people during the American Revolution. This land and this home came to her family from her mother's side of the family. And they spent summers here in Strasburg, New York, where she was the neighbor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was her neighbor in the Hudson Valley. And she played baseball with him. She grew up with him. Uh, she and her brother grew up <laughs> poor. And so they had, uh, you know, this was quite a neighborhood, right? <laughs> the uh, Geraldine Livingston and her siblings and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So this was quite a swanky address, uh, but they maintain their connection and their friendship all throughout their lives. And she was a guest at the White House many times of the Roosevelts when he was president of the United States. So, so she has some pretty swanky connections. So she doesn't have much in terms of education. And I think for those of us who put so much emphasis on education, um, she didn't attend school. She was tutored at home until she was 15 years old. Her family hired tutors would come and tutor the children of the, home, of the family in the home until she was 15. She did go to France for, uh, to a convent school in France in her late teens. Um, but she never attended school. She did not have any degrees or certificates, but she does receive an honorary, she does receive honorary degrees for her work in her life. Um, and in 1931, she received a honorary master's degree of philanthropy. Reasonable 
uh, Rutgers. She was the first woman to receive such a degree. And in 1959, she also received a Doctor of Letters from Monmouth University. And when she received this uh, degree from uh, Rutgers, she wrote to Mabel Smith Douglas, right? Douglas College is named for Mabel Smith Douglas. She wrote to Mabel Smith Douglas a letter where she said, I must humbly confess that I have no academic regalia, nor, which is to me far more distressing, any college or university degrees. As a matter of fact, I have no diplomas from any schools of any sort, kind of variety. My scholastic career can be described as it occurred under tutors, governesses, and private schools. So she, uh, very humble, you know, kind of letter um, where she is honored, but she recognizes that she sort of doesn't have what we would consider today a proper education. Although in the 1800s, the late 1800s, a woman of a prominent family like Geraldine Thompson um, often didn't go to college, either did Eleanor Roosevelt for that matter. So they really have that in common that women of a certain class, they really didn't think it was proper for them to go and be uh, highly educated. One of the things that I also want to talk about in her private life is something that really shaped her also. So her family shapes her, right? The way that she's raised, the influence of the women in her family in social service and reform work. But there's also shaping of her through tragedy. And a lot of the things that end up being really influential in her life are tragic things. And one of the things that happens to her is that she, she gets tuberculosis. And as a young woman, she contracted tuberculosis. And um, this really shapes her life in many ways. So for, for those of you who don't know what it is, tuberculosis was the COVID-19 of the 19th century. Um, and it's really interesting to be talking about tuberculosis right now. Uh, I think we can really sort of relate to how terrifying have, living during a pandemic could be. And in the end of the 1800s, tuberculosis hit the United States with a vengeance. And um, it was the plague of the 19th century. Tuberculosis is a bacteria that can lay in your lungs and it can lay dormant in your lungs and never become active. But it, if it becomes active, the, uh, the victim of tuberculosis will have a racking cough, fatigue, and waste away. You become very thin and weak and fatigued. That's why they used to call it consumption. You may have heard of it as consumption. It consumes you. And people who suffered with tuberculosis could suffer with it for years and years before it killed them or they recuperated. This was a terrifying disease. They don't know how, they did not know how people got it. It was a bacteria. You know, it wasn't a virus like we're dealing with with COVID-19, but it was a bacteria. And this was in a time without penicillin, right? Without antibiotics. So tuberculosis, uh, she catches tuberculosis as many people did in the 19th century because it, it afflicted rich and poor. You know, she was rich, but she still got sick and poor too, poor people too. So it was a terrifying experience and, uh, her, in, uh, in the book, A Triangle of Land, which is the history of Brookdale Community College, the writer Linda Lott Rizzo wrote that her own experience with physical suffering was undoubtedly a motivating factor in her concern for the physical and mental health of others. It is something when you are facing death and have a terrible bout with disease, it changes you and it makes you more empathetic. It makes some people who recover have empathy. And this really changes her life in several ways. And I'm gonna explain how it changes her life. Before there were antibiotics, the cure or the treatment for antibiotics was fresh air. 
especially dry air. And so people would be uh, encouraged to be outside, play outside, be in the sunshine, that the sunshine they believed could kill bacteria and that this was a healthy thing. So on this poster here, it talks about outdoor play is necessary to good health and that children should play outside and that it's, uh, it's important for health, right? And to fight tuberculosis. The other thing that happens, and I learned a lot of this from uh, PBS's documentary series on tuberculosis that was uh, produced from the American Experience, which was really a fine documentary, talked about these uh, health seekers. People went out west because the air is dry in the mountains. So there were a lot of people who were suffering with tuberculosis who would go out to Colorado and go to the sanitariums where they would uh, say in these individual little huts. And I don't know if you can see these, but the these huts are little individual little huts. People would stay by themselves. So they didn't spread their tuberculosis to anybody else. They stayed in, isolated in these huts and they were ventilated out the roof uh, so that fresh air could get in, no stagnant air. And so we're still worried about ventilation, right? With COVID-19, so it's, it makes a lot of sense in that respect and has a lot of similarities. So people would go out west to breathe the, the nice dry air for their lungs, dry out their lungs, to isolate themselves and to get better. And so this was something that people believed was uh, a, a cure and it was very popular for people to go out to Colorado. That tens of thousands of people went to Colorado for this reason and some got better and thousands died too. I mean, there's a lot of people who went to these sanitariums who don't get better either. Um, and Geraldine Thompson goes to Colorado. Uh, she doesn't go to a sanitarium, but she goes to uh, the home of one of her mother's friends and she goes to get healthy from tuberculosis. And while she's out there, she meets a young uh, woman, a Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson Preston. And as soon as Elizabeth Thompson Preston meets her, she writes a telegram to her brother, Lewis. And in the telegram she wrote, have just met the girl you should marry, come at once. <laughs> so her, her brother, Tom, uh, her brother, Lewis, uh, comes to Colorado. And that is how she meets her husband because she had met her husband, Lewis's sister, Elizabeth, in Colorado while she was recuperating from tuberculosis. So here he is, here's Lewis. So Lewis Thompson was born in October of 1865, right after the end of the Civil War. And he had also had tuberculosis and it took him three years to recover from his tuberculosis. And tuberculosis completely changes the course of Lewis's life. He had gone to Virginia Military Institute, you know, the West Point of the South. You know, he was very, um, he was a, 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 an excellent shot. He was one of the best uh, marksmen at VMI. Then he went to MIT and he became a civil engineer. But because of his tuberculosis, he could not work inside. And his doctors told his parents that he would never be able to hold a job because the tuberculosis symptoms returned when he worked indoors. So when he's 30 years old, he meets Geraldine through the introduction with his, from his sister. And they married very quickly after their they were they met and so in june of june of 1896 lewis thompson and geraldine thompson got married in stottsburg on the hudson at saint margaret's chapel so here is the uh the lewis lewis thompson's family background a little bit these are his parents evelyn and william payne thompson and he's kind of, I want to kind of introduce him because he's the one who buys Brookdale Farm. He's the one who gets them to Brookdale and Lakecroft. So I think they need to be introduced to us. So William Payne Thompson was a soldier in the Confederacy. After the Civil War ended, he went to work for Standard Oil 
and worked with John Rockefeller in the Standard Oil Company and became very, very wealthy man after the Civil War. And in 1893, uh, 1891, he came to the Jersey Shore for vacation. They came to Seabright for a family vacation. He brought uh, Lewis and his siblings, Elizabeth and William to Seabright for a vacation. And it was there that he became familiar with the horse racing culture in Monmouth County and with Brookdale Farm. And so in 1893, he bought Brookdale Farm, about 800 acres of, of farmland for $135,000. And so that is how Brookdale Farm came into the Thompson, uh, into the Thompson family. So they got married in 1896. And right after they got married, they moved to Brookdale Farm because Brookdale Farm uh, was passed after the death of Lewis's father to the three Thompson siblings, Lewis, William, and Elizabeth. Lewis ended up buying out the other two siblings and owning the entire farm himself. And so they came to Brookdale Farm and she lives there until her death in 1967. Their marriage is very interesting. And I think I have a lot of questions about what the real story is about their marriage, uh, but it's very unusual marriage. He was a very wealthy man and he supported her career. She was a, uh, very active in her social work, her reform work and her political activism, but he supported it. He, she had the funds, she was able to use the money uh, that they had for her causes. And she's very generous. Uh, she never took a, she does all this work throughout her career. She never takes a paycheck. She never takes a, any pay for anything she does. She does everything as a volunteer, um, but he supports it. So he's kind of unusual for this generation to support her causes and her interests. But he also is not with her that much. Because he does not work as a civil engineer, he spends half the year away from Brookdale Farm. He goes to another plantation that he bought in Southern Georgia, very close to the Florida border. He bought 15,000 acres um, in Georgia called Sunny Hill Plantation, where he spent a great deal of time. So this was an arrangement. Uh, they are married for 40 years. He supports her independence, but he's also not around that much. So we have some questions that are left unanswered about the true nature of their relationship. The other thing that's important is uh, the impact of tuberculosis on her work in Monmouth County. And when she and Lewis moved to Monmouth County, uh, she is very concerned about tuberculosis afflicting the residents of Monmouth County. And she works to pressure the freeholders to, in, to support an, a sanitarium in Monmouth County to treat tuberculosis. And she is responsible for opening the first tuberculosis treatment center in Monmouth County called the Allenwood Sanitarium. And I'd like to show this picture because you can see here, everybody has their own little apartment here. You kind of can see everybody's isolated from each other. And they're all out in the sun, taking the sun <laughs> and breathing the good air, right? So she sort of uses the same treatment that she took um, and she adapts it to Monmouth County to do that. So again, her experience with tuberculosis leads her to try to help others in Monmouth County. And her, her motto was no uncared for tuberculosis in Monmouth County. She wanted everybody who had tuberculosis in Monmouth County to get care and to get treatment for it. And uh, that facility is now called the Geraldine L. Thompson Care Center. Uh, so 
her legacy lives on after tuberculosis is largely eradicated. Um, her clinic is continues. The other thing that's sort of a, a tragedy uh, in regards to Geraldine Thompson and tuberculosis is that her, her daughter, Geraldine Thompson, who they called Puss, her daughter, Geraldine, so you see everybody in the family's name is Geraldine, uh, her grandmother, her and her now her daughter, her daughter, Geraldine, had tuberculosis and died of tuberculosis in 1949. She had it for 20 years. She suffered with tuberculosis. So it touches her life, her husband's life. It inspires her work and it also takes one of her children. So her experiences um, of tragedy and um, is a very important part of understanding who she is and her work and her commitment to work for the good of others. Here's an, it's a kind of an interesting picture. This is a picture of the Thompson family in 1905. So this is Brookdale Farm, 1905. You can sort of see a little bit of what it looked like and how people were riding in horse and carriage. And at the bottom here, you can see that the, the picture is labeled. So in the back here is Lewis here. Here's Lewis, the husband. And here are the children. Here's William and uh, the children here, which are hard to see, but in the front of the carriage here, Puss and uh, Elizabeth and um, Geraldine, where is she? She is here also somewhere um, in the carriage. Um, so we see this is the Thompson family out for a, a nice ride. <laughs> in their carriage and kind of can get a little bit of a sense of 1905, what their lives were like. So this is a quote from uh, their daughter, Betty Babcock, in her letter that she wrote to Thompson Park as part of a history of Thompson Park. She wrote, to the child I was, Brookdale was paradise, not the house, the fields, woods, brook, wooded ravine, and all the animals. So they're nature lovers, they love the farm and really uh, Elizabeth or Betty as she's referred to, Betty Babcock, the daughter uh, is very, waxes very poetic about the beauty of the farm and how it was a paradise for the children to play every day. She describes Lincroft also, Betty Babcock writes that all the roads were dirt, dusty and dry weather, muddy and wet, often closed by snow after a heavy fall. So here's a picture of Newman Springs Road. <laughs> uh, looks a little different than it does now, um, but this is the intersection um, in downtown Lincroft. And you could see the, the dirt road and the horse and carriage and the rural environment that was there. Here's the Lincroft Inn in about 1910. So you can sort of see what the Lincroft Inn originally looked like in 1910 as well. So I like to kind of just paint a little bit of a picture what life was like for the Thompsons early in their marriage when they were raising children in, in Lincroft. So the children, so let's talk a little bit about the children. Uh, Geraldine and Lewis Thompson had four children between 1897 and 1904. They had a son, William, Betty, who I just been quoting, and Geraldine, who I told you died in 1949, uh, she was married a couple times. So she is Geraldine Morgan Thompson Verbig Boone. Those are her two husbands that she had. And their youngest son, Louis Thompson III. And they also adopt a cousin. Louis's cousin uh, was an orphan and there was nobody in the family to take care of her. So Louis and Geraldine went to West Virginia and picked up their cousin Anne and raised her and adopted her as one of, as their own child. And Elizabeth, who introduced them, the, the Elizabeth who wrote the telegram, come here and marry this woman right away. She died of complications after childbirth, after the birth of her fourth child. And the Thompsons take her four children and raise them at Brookdale Farm. And their, their father uh, sort of 
I don't want to say abandons them, but their father sort of says, okay, you want to raise my four kids? Bye. And he doesn't even come actually and see them for eight years um, after his wife's death. So they had nine kids <laughs> living in Brookdale. At the same time, they had their four, the one they adopted and Elizabeth's four children all living in this house um, on Brookdale Farm. So they had a real houseful. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, this idea of raising nine kids. So she's raising nine kids. Now she's a prominent woman. She had nurses and governesses. She had, you know, she had help. She had uh, some people to help her raise these nine kids, but her husband wasn't really there. And this is what Betty writes about her father. My father, whenever a fishing and shooting season opened from Canada, geese and ducks in the early fall, salmon in spring, bonefish off the Florida Keys in March, rail birds, shore birds, and down to Georgia from September to March, quail, wild turkey, and doves. He was on hand and loving every minute of it. June, July of August and August, we got him. <laughs> so, so she's she really is talking about, and she she sort of is. Uh, really reveals that her parents are not together that much. And her mother is there running the farm, raising nine kids and doing all her charity work as well. So uh, I think that there's a lot of questions here in my mind about what kind of marriage this was. And uh, certainly they were wealthy people, but um, it seems like for a variety, uh, for a number of years, there's not a lot of togetherness. Also, um, they were uh, a very athletic family. As I said, he was uh, a great sportsman, known as a sportsman, a great shot. And she was very athletic too. Geraldine Thompson was extremely athletic that she rode horses. Every morning she went out and she jogged around the track at Brookdale Farm. Early in the morning, she'd go out with her dogs and jog around the track and come home and take a cold bath and head off to Trenton to do her work in uh, social reform or politics. So they were both extremely athletic and outdoorsy. She loved the outdoors, loved the, to be outside. So uh, both are athletic and... Um, so... In addition to their marriage, Geraldine Thompson also had a very intense friendship with Miriam Van Waters, who I introduced you to earlier in the earlier slide. Miriam Van Waters um, was a woman reformer who ran a prison in Massachusetts, in Framingham, Massachusetts. She ran a women's prison there. And they met at a conference at a um, criminal justice conference in the middle of the 1920s. And not too many of their letters survive, but we would call what they had a romantic friendship. And I said earlier that I think that Geraldine Thompson really belongs in a 19th century historical context. And part of the reason why I believe that is that in the 19th century, women were encouraged to have these very intimate, close, friendships with other women, that they were very passionately attached to each other. They relied on each other for emotional support. They went on vacation together. They wrote to each other every day. Nearly every day they communicated. And uh, once they have telephones, they call each other daily too. It's not a sexual relationship as we would think of as a, um, a physically sexual relationship. And in fact, neither of these women identify themselves as lesbian. Lesbian is, does not become a word in common usage until really after the 1920s. And it's very hard for us as uh, 2021 people to read these letters and not think that. They are very affectionate. Uh, Geraldine Thompson calls Miriam Van Waters her dearest love in these letters. They're extremely gushy and extremely emotional letters. They have a 40 year relationship. They help each other. They network with each other in their work. They support each other in their, in their personal lives. 
and they are the dearest and closest of friends. So this is another part of her personal life that is sort of mysterious, that we will probably never really know uh, the true nature of. However, after Geraldine Thompson dies, the letters that Miriam Van Waters wrote to her disappear. And uh, so somebody ditched them. Uh, so uh, I am a bit skeptical uh, about maybe the nature of those letters and perhaps that uh, they, they were somewhat embarrassing uh, to somebody. Miriam Van Waters often came to Brookdale. Uh, Geraldine Thompson wanted to build her her own little cottage on the grounds, she wanted her to come and have her own place to live there. I mean, that's how, uh, how close they were with each other. Um, so there's that. So let's talk a little bit about her work, her political work. So that's her, so that's her personal life, right? Her kids, her husband, her dear friend, her illnesses, right? So this is really her personal life. Let's talk a little bit about her professional, uh, her professional life. And what did women in the 1800s, what did they do in reform work and in helping their communities? And I think the best historian for understanding this is Estelle Friedman. Estelle Friedman wrote uh, an article, really famous article called Separatism as Strategy, and where she describes the creation of separate women only institutions. She talks about how in the 1800s, men and women were in sort of separate social worlds. Women went to women's clubs, men went to men's clubs. Women had their own friends and colleges and network Men went to play golf with other men and smoke cigars and play cards with other men. They went to offices with men, right? So there's this separation of men and women. But she says that women use this separate world to be extremely productive. So women join movements like the Temperance Union, Women's Christian Temperance Union. And the Christian Temperance Union was a, the biggest movement of the 19th century to stop drinking to outlaw the sale and consumption of alcohol. Geraldine Thompson's in that organization. She does not drink. She does not have alcohol served in her house. She thinks that alcohol is evil. She belongs to women's clubs. And she's very active in using the women's clubs to do good work, to raise money for scholarships, to do good work in the community, and so the women's club movement of the 1800s is very important for understanding her point of view on how you, how you are an activist. And this is how she does her activism. She joins women's network. She uses her network of other women to get stuff done. And uh, they understand that suffrage, getting the, the right to vote was a really important part of being able to change society and to clean up the problems that society had, and mostly to use the vote to protect the family. Men don't understand what children need, women do. Women understand that children need nurturing and clean air and pure milk and, and good schooling and a playground, right? Women understand this, men care about money. So the women's clubs really viewed the vote as a very key thing for being effective and making the change in society that they thought was needed. So the women's clubs. So the women's clubs are really important. They are a variety of different kinds of women's organizations and they all serve their communities in different ways. And this is largely um, done by middle-class women. There were also black women's clubs uh, because the white women's clubs excluded the black women, uh, unfortunately. And so black women had their own clubs to work with their communities to raise money for scholarships and to help, uh, their, uh, help black families to elevate themselves and do good work there. So we see that this becomes a really important part of female culture. 
joining clubs, doing good work, socializing also within those women, networking with those women to make an impact on, uh, on their communities and doing good deeds. And so what Estelle Friedman says, at, or what Sarah Evans says in Born for Liberty, Liberty is that women car start to blend their goodness, their female morality and goodness and maternal instincts with patriotism, right? We're gonna use our female goodness in order to do patriotic work in, in our communities and in politics. So we see that women be, begin to view themselves as both protector of the family and of the democracy as well. So uh, Geraldine Thompson totally believes this. Her, her statements, her actions, her career are totally in, in harmony with this idea that women are not the same as men. Women are different than men. They have different view of, of the family. And uh, she becomes a member of the State Federation of Women's Clubs in New Jersey. So in New Jersey, the club women make a very big impact all over the state of New Jersey. And John Cunningham, who's sort of like the, the probably the eminent historian of New Jersey history, the preeminent historian of New Jersey history, wrote that the club women were dedicated to improving their world and the country. And the things that they were particularly interested in was prison reform, tuberculosis and public health, environmental conservation, and child welfare. These are the things that the club women in New Jersey were interested in. These are the exact same things that Geraldine Thompson works on her entire career, these four things. And so she's totally aligned with the club women movement in New Jersey. And so she, for 40, four decades, pursues environmental issues, working for child welfare, fighting tuberculosis and trying to put in public health institutions and to reform the prisons. She wanted children, she wanted a juvenile justice system so that children aren't treated the same way as adults in juvenile justice, that women were not incarcerated with men, that mentally ill people were not incarcerated with criminals. So she really is trying to have a humanitarian view of uh, society's institutions. One of the things that the State Federation of Women's Clubs, excuse the abbreviation there, the State Federation of Women's Clubs is SFWC, that the State Federation of Women's Clubs were a little bit hamstrung, right? Because women didn't have the right to vote until 1920. So how are they gonna get change if they can't vote? So what they start to do is they, have a, they had a strategy and their strategy was, we don't have the right to vote, but we can bring shame on the government. <laughs> and so what they did was in do investigations to expose, uh, expose problems, send people into the prisons and write reports that talk about the filth, the poor hygiene, the poor diet, uh, the poor conditions. And then the government would be embarrassed by these reports. And this would put pressure on lawmakers to make change. So they were very good at this. And they, it is not partisan, it's a nonpartisan issue. And they just relentlessly embarrass the government by exposing the problems in all the state institutions. And Geraldine Thompson does this her whole career. She was famous for needling the lawmakers in Trenton. Even at her funeral, one of the um, Governor Driscoll who came to uh, give a eulogy at her funeral talks about how she needled him <laughs> and talked about how she would show up at his office and kind of force her way in and, and um, pressure him to do what she wanted. And so these women were very um, tuned in to how to make change even before they had the right to vote in 1920. Some of their greatest accomplishments, the women's uh, 
clubs in New Jersey have the biggest, the first biggest environmental victory at the Palisades. And the Palisades are up in Northern New Jersey and they were being destroyed by industry. And the women's clubs pressure lawmakers to protect the Palisades as an environmental issue. And they succeed. And this is an enormous environmental victory. And it was done by the women, the women's clubs who say, look, we have to preserve the natural beauty of our state. We can't let industry just destroy everything and pollute and, and destroy this place. Now, let's think about Geraldine Thompson. What is she doing even in the, 19, in the 1960s? She's saving her farm, right? She's, she's gonna give her farm to the county so it is saved to be a park for everyone, right? So she carries this spirit consistently all the way through her entire career. The other big victory of the women's club was the creation of a woman's college in New Jersey. They wanted very much to start a public women's college in New Jersey. Again, this idea of the woman's networking, right? So that women could go to a woman's public college and they succeed in 1918. The New Jersey College for Women is open, later named Douglas College, right? It's still there. And so the State Federation of Women's Clubs in New Jersey are successful in these two initiatives. They also start the State Charities Aid Association and uh, Geraldine Thompson is the first woman in the state of New Jersey to ever be appointed to a state board. And her appointment to this state board, the first woman ever appointed, she was committed to trying to improve conditions of poor people in New Jersey. What was it like to be poor in New Jersey? If you were poor and you couldn't pay your bills, you had to go to the municipal government and ask for help. And if the municipal government thought you were worthy of help, they would help you. But if they didn't, you ended up at the poor house. You were incarcerated. You were put into an institutional setting called an almshouse or a workhouse to work off your debts. And poor law goes all the way back in the history of New Jersey to its founding. And so she wanted to change that. She didn't want poor people to be incarcerated for their poverty. And so she actually funds a study. She funds it herself, a study to make a report on the history of New Jersey poor laws. And so they start to change the way they treated poor people because of her advocacy. And she also was very interested in creating separate institutions for different groups. So instead of putting orphans into prison, you know, you have to create a welfare system for foster care. Instead of putting mentally ill people into prisons, you have to create a mental health system that will give care as well as uh, hospitals and psychiatric uh, hospitals for them. So she was very important on this state board in providing this system with, uh, with guidance. She also is important for creating a women's only prison. She, among other women in the state of New Jersey, like Caroline Whitpen, were very much in favor of the creation of a separate uh, prison for women so that women would not be incarcerated with men. And the New Jersey Reformatory for Women was opened in 1913, and she hires um, Edna Mahan to be the uh, administrator over the correctional institution and she hires Edna Mahan because Miriam Van Waters recommended her, right? So, <laughs> so she's using her network, right? Using her network of, of other women. 
The other thing that's important about the creation of a woman's prison is not just to house women in a separate place, but she believed that in order to, uh, she believed in rehabilitation. It was not just to incarcerate and punish, but that women had to be incarcerated and it had to feel like a home. It had to feel like home for these women so that they would be able to, when their uh, term was up, that they would be able to rejoin society and be useful in society. So it was a very much a rehabilitation uh, philosophy in this new, uh, in these institutions. So ultimately we see that the suffrage movement in New Jersey and the, the clubs in New Jersey and these women in, uh, in reform form an alliance. And this is a, cru a crucial part of why suffrage is passed in New Jersey in 1919, that the women who were in the clubs wanted to vote and so they supported suffrage. But after suffrage, we see there's a lot of political chaos in New Jersey because women didn't know what to do. Once they had the right to vote, they weren't sure whether they should join the Republicans or the Democrats or what they should do. We see in New Jersey, ultimately what happens is that four out of five New Jersey suffragists join the Republican party and about 60,000 women joined the Republican party in the 1920s. Geraldine Thompson joins the Republican party too. And so she is a lifelong Republican and she is a, uh, she fits the profile of women who are Episcopalian and wealthy and um, uh, reform minded because the Republican party she believed represented her values. And so she was a staunch Republican her entire life. After suffrage, and this is uh, referring to a book called After Women, which is the legacy of New Jersey suffragists, Elise, uh, Felice Gordon writes about how um, the women's club had 26,000 members. So the New Jersey women's clubs had, was the largest women's organization in New Jersey. And they were very much moral prodders that they really wanted uh, to use their activism and use their vote to shape a new order. And what Felice Gordon really means about means by this is she wants, they want to purify society. They want to bring their moral goodness to everything. They're very idealistic in a lot of ways. They want to be able to fix society with their vote. And they are, Felice Gordon uses the term moral prodders. And I would say that Geraldine Thompson is a moral prodder. <laughs> she is very moral. She wants to do good and help everyone and everybody to be uh, healthy. She is also the first woman from New Jersey to be a delegate to the Republican National Convention. And she attended, uh, she went to the Republican National Convention in 1924 as a delegate from New Jersey, the first woman to be a delegate from, uh, from New Jersey to the Republican National Convention. And uh, she never runs for office, but she understood the importance of political activism in getting her what she wanted done. So she wants, she wants there to be, uh, you know, child welfare and tuberculosis reform and uh, good public health measures and mental hospitals and all these things. She knows she's got to be political in order to get it done. So she really understood that politics and her moral causes had to had to work together, but she's very, uh, very practical in it um, as well. So this is a picture of the 1924 Republican National Conf uh, Convention in Cleveland. She went to Cleveland for this convention. She never ran for office, but she is uh, definitely a, an important political figure. In the 1920s, she is written about in the New York Herald Tribune by a really famous journalist. Emma Bugby uh, writes an article about her and she's famous in her own right. Emma Bugby is a really famous journalist. And the reason why Thompson is in, this, in the paper in 1927 was because she was embroiled in a fight in her own party, in the Republican party. She was a temperance woman. She did not believe that drinking should happen. She, was a, she wanted to outlaw 
the sale and consumption of alcohol. She believed it was evil and damaging. But the Republican Party, now they had outlawed drinking, right? The 18th Amendment had outlawed uh, alcohol. It was prohibition. But in New Jersey, the Republicans in New Jersey decide they're not gonna enforce prohibition. So it's like a joke, right? You could have a speakeasy. Uh, people would be making their own, their own hooch and things, but she was really mad about this. She was angry that the Republican party was not going to stand up and enforce the rules of prohibition. And so she's the subject of this article and she's asked by Emma Bugby about what does she think about women gaining the right to vote? And this is what Geraldine Thompson says. Great good has come from suffrage. Women have taken the lid off pretty much every, everything in political procedure. That is women's nature. She has disclosed what is happening in politics as it has never been disclosed before. It offended my common sense that men should not see that the right methods of doing things are the most practical in the end. Professional politicians play politics as a game. So she's really mad that the men in the Republican party are not following the highest standards, right? They're just gonna let people drink if they want. They're gonna turn a blind eye they're not going to enforce prohibition. And she's so mad, she actually quits the Republican National Committee. And uh, so she is very disillusioned by this. She's very mad about this. And the, um, the article goes on uh, and she says, you know, I'm idealistic, but it's practical, right? She, she says that, Drinking is the greatest enemy to the good and beautiful that we have. So she really believed in prohibition as being important for health and for, uh, for families and for to alleviate poverty. And so she ends up joining a committee in New Jersey called the Committee for Law Enforcement. And the Committee for Law Enforcement, their job was to enforce prohibition. So she is uh, still fighting this battle. She called herself an irreconcilable dry, somebody who's dry doesn't drink, right? So she says, I'm an, she's called an, she will not be changed. She, she will not have her opinion changed on drinking. And uh, she says at the end of the article, it'll be a long, hard fight, but we'll win, you know, we'll prevail in the end. It will be a long, hard fight. She's recognizing that this is going to be difficult. Now we all know prohibition was repealed in 1933, so it isn't a victory for her. Uh, but I think it's really important to recognize something. She doesn't always win. She loses a lot, but she never gives up, and she never loses her principles. She never abandons her principles, and she she was quoted in the Daily Record in August of 1940 saying, nothing is futile. Even if a project gets results only once out of every five times or once out of every 10 times, that's something to be thankful for. At least that much has been accomplished. So she never loses. So even though she loses, we know she loses the battle in prohibition, but she never is discouraged. You're not gonna win every political battle. That's just the way it goes but she never gets jaded. She never becomes bitter. She always says, you just keep going. And even if you only win one out of every 10 times, that's something that's valuable, right? So she recognizes that that's, that's difficult. Is she a feminist, right? This is another thing that I think is an interesting uh, setting, putting her in the setting of, 19th century or 20th century womanhood. In the Triangle of Land, they call her a feminist. I don't 
don't think she's a feminist the way that us 20th century women who came of age in the 70s are feminists. She's a 19th century maternal feminist. She does not believe that women and men are the same. She believes that female identity is rooted in the home, in motherhood, in morality and goodness and motherhood and nurturing. And so she really embraces a different idea of feminism, that women are important in politics, women are important in society because they bring something different. They bring a unique quality where they will represent and advocate for goodness, for morality, that they are going to use their networks of women in order to get things done. But they're not cracking into the military, for example. Uh, they are not demanding equal treatment um, in male institutions. They're happy and, and productive in their female institutions, right? So it's a, a different type of feminism and it's really important to put her in historical context for her feminism to make sense. She's a 19th century feminist. And so the late 20th century feminists that most of us think of when we think of feminism, we think of Gloria Steinem type feminism is different. And I think it's really important for us to recognize her feminism as being rooted in 19th century values. Um, and she brings this to her work. Uh, she believes in the institutions in public health and mental health in child welfare, in environmentalism, all these things are to bring a private home-like atmosphere to government, that we should treat children uh, and nurture them and treat them carefully. We shouldn't have child labor, right? We should, we should be giving kids education and, and, and nurturance. Uh, so she really is um, a maternal feminist, somebody who believes in bringing the qualities of, of mothers and uh, motherhood and goodness and morality to the public sphere, to government. And so what does she do in Monmouth County? Monmouth County had no institutions before she lived there. There were no community services. And she works to establish child welfare, public health, prison reform, uh, parole boards. She was a very important person on the Monmouth County Parole Board. She put in place educational programs and much more. She leads the institutions from 1918 until she retires in 1952. So she is a very long career of service. And as I said, volunteer. She never got a paycheck for this. She did all this work for decades for her community and the state of New Jersey. She established the Monmouth County Office of Social Services that provided a wide array of services to people in terms of healthcare, uh, doctors, um, mental health. And now it's called the Visiting Nurse Association. It's still there, right? The Visiting Nurse Association is still in existence. And she also um, was very important in prison reform association, in parole, and in the Allenwood Hospital for tuberculosis, as I mentioned before. So she had an enormous impact on the association of the, on the um, institutions in Monmouth County. And she served on the Monmouth County, um, on the board, uh, the state board of control of the State Department of Institutions. And who's she sitting with at this table? She's sitting with Eleanor Roosevelt. So this is a picture of her and Eleanor Roosevelt at her retirement dinner. So she's quite elderly here. She's in her late 80s, uh, in her mid 80s at least. She's about 85 years old in this photograph. And Eleanor Roosevelt attended her retirement dinner and she served eight terms on the board of control of institutions. She was reappointed uh, by both Republican and Democratic governors. 
So her work was bipartisan. She was not a partisan. Didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat, you had to stay focused on your cause and your work and not let that bother you. And so Eleanor Roosevelt, even though she was a Democrat, was a very important ally to her. And in the daily record in February of June uh, 1951, uh, the journalist wrote, she led the Garden State out of the weeds as far as prison reform, child welfare, physical and mental hygiene are concerned. So she is the woman who provides the leadership for the creation of all these services. Monmouth County had nothing. Her daughter writes that the creation of the state board of institutions was her brainchild. She's the one who thought of creating a state board to run the institutions. And she knew, she says, as a best and only way to that, to, to assure that state institutions of every description being run by qualified administrators and not political hacks. <laughs> so that experience of 1927 that I told you about, where she gets burned by the, the men in the Republican party over prohibition, not again, you're not gonna get me twice, right? So she makes sure that you're not gonna put some political hack in there to ruin everything and just make a name for himself. I'm gonna make sure that there's good people in there. So I'm gonna make it and I'm gonna lead it. And she does it for um, almost 40 years, right? So it's a really, uh, I think it's interesting. And she, she had to pester the legislature to create this board, the state board. And she apparently was relentless in pestering them to get to create it. And finally they were like, this, la this lady is really, really nice but we got to create this state board because she will just not stop. She's pestering us and pestering us. Uh, she was, she told in an interview in August of 1940 in the Daily Record, she said, we must have groups working together, whether we approve of each other or no. Like, in other words, put that stuff aside. You got to put your differences aside, political differences aside and work together because you're never going to get anything done, right? So she was uh, very energetic. She talked about Republicans and Democrats. She goes, there's nothing angelic about Republicans and devilish about Democrats. They're just groups of people. One puts more emphasis on human relations. The other stresses material affairs. Country needs them both to keep from being too hard boiled or too sentimental. She wanted people to, re to focus on the cause and put your political differences to the side, right? So we could use a little of her today, I think probably. Here she is with Eleanor Roosevelt again. Eleanor Roosevelt came to Brookdale a lot. She visited all the time and she was very good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. She was invited to the White House, even though she was a Republican uh, and Eleanor vote, visited Brookdale Farm. They had very similar interests. Eleanor was also interested in child welfare and education and human rights and mental health. And she was interested in a lot of the same things. She's actually a distant relative of Geraldine Thompson's. Her grandmother Hall was a Livingston. So they had kind of far back a little bit. They had some, uh, some common, uh, they had some common ancestors there on the Livingston side. So they have a lot of things in common. Eleanor also did not go to school, educated in France. New York family, prominent family, a marriage with a man that she had a weird relationship with <laughs> and had a kind of an arrangement with. She's also extremely energetic. They're both extremely energetic women who get a tremendous amount done, have their own careers and both have romantic friendships, very, very close romantic friendships with other women. Eleanor with Lorena Hickok, Geraldine Thompson with Miriam Van Waters. And so they have a lot in common and they had very common and they had similar uh, interests, humanitarian interests. Here's again, Eleanor Roosevelt attending a fundraiser for the Visiting Nurse Association in Monmouth County in 1949. Here's Eleanor with Geraldine Thompson here in her seventies here. And this is my last thing I wanna, 
tell you, which is about her work in environmental and preservation. So in the environment, here's a picture of, uh, you know, this is the walking path at Thompson Park, which was part of Brookdale Farm. And she always loved nature. She loved the outdoors. She was very athletic and she loved children. She was a very much a lover of birds and she was a member of the Audubon Society. She provided a scholarship for students to go to the, camp, the Audubon camps in Maine and uh, in the summer and study the birds. She loved birds. She was just, the Daily Record wrote about her in 1951 that she gets disappointed because she can't get every bird in Monmouth County to come to her bird feeder. <laughs> so she loved birds, she loved the outdoors. And she also has several things she does in her life that, that, are demonstrate, that demonstrate her love for nature. She creates a, um, at the American Museum of Natural History, she creates a science center for children and education. Her sister Margaret, when she died, Geraldine Thompson gave over 300 acres that she inherited in the Hudson Valley to create a federal park in her sister's name. And Margaret Norrie State Park is still there. And Geraldine Thompson donated over 300 acres for the creation of that park. That was in the 1930s. She also lobbies really hard for the state to buy thousands of acres of land to create Island Beach State Park in Ocean County. So she has a very long history of environmental accomplishments and generosity, just incredible generosity. So it's the 1950s now, she's getting elderly and Monmouth County is changing. It's no longer those dirt roads, right? That I showed you at the beginning. And the population of Monmouth County is growing the Garden State Parkway was built, which increased the number of people in Monmouth County, moving to Monmouth County as a bedroom community. And there was a terrible problem with development and a lack of county parkland. At the same time, she's getting older. Two of her children died in the 1940s. Her daughter, Betty, lived in Long Island with her family and her son Lewis died in 1965 of cancer. So she had always hoped that one of her children would take Brookdale Farm and pass it down through the family from generation to generation. But it becomes clear that that is not in the cards. After Lewis died in 1965, Lewis's wife was not interested in living in Lincroft. Betty lived in Long Island. The other two siblings had passed away. And so she becomes really concerned about what's going to happen to Brookdale Farm. And so she had begun a conversation in the 1950s with the freeholders where she was working with them to set up a donation of 215 acres of her farm and the buildings on the on the farm to the county to solely be used for park purposes. And this donation at this time, as Monmouth County was developing and developing very quickly, was crucial because farms were being turned into neighborhoods and subdivisions with houses on them. And had the, the farm not been preserved, you can never go back, right? You can't go from being developed to back to the way it was when it was pristine. She donates this 215 acres to the county and it becomes the centerpiece of the entire Monmouth County Park system. And it's due to her donation that at least four other widows in Monmouth County decide to follow her lead and donate their land upon their deaths in their, in their will, Tatum Park, Uber Woods, um, other, two other farms also become donated, are donated to the county and Monmouth County park system 
is born. And this is sort of her last great gift of generosity to the county and to the state. And the, her mansion, her, uh, her house that she lived in is the headquarters for the Monmouth County Park System. One of her last interviews that she gave to the newspapers, she was asked, um, what's the secret to youth? You know, what's your secret for youthfulness? Because she lived to be 95 years old, right? And when she was 94, she gave this interview and uh, she told the reporter her secret to youth, keep working for at least one cause, preferably an unpopular one. Right, so always work for the underdog, right? Work for the person, work for the group that nobody wants to help, that nobody is interested in advocating for. Stand up, right, to the uh, David and, you know, be the Goliath, you know, be the David fighting against the Goliath. And there's actually a great story that Betty Thompson tells, uh, Betty Babcock tells about how her mother used to read bedtime stories to them every night. And she tells the story how her mother was such a great actress. She would read these bedtime stories and they would just be enthralled with the story. And she would read the story of David and Goliath. And I think, you know, what a great metaphor for her life. You know, somebody who would always fight for the little guy against the Goliath, right? Fight for the person in, in jail, fight for the juvenile delinquent, fight for the, for the orphan, fight for the person who's mentally ill, fight for the people who are weak, right? Because that's really your, uh, where you can make them do the most good, right? So I hope that I convinced you that she deserves to be remembered and that she truly is New Jersey's first lady. Thank you so much, Jane. I don't know how long this, <laughs> this zoom call is going to go because i had set it up for an hour and a half and we're just about at that point uh, um but does it run i mean does it keep going does anybody know oh okay all right so thank everybody i just love that talk please thank jane it, it was really an amazing talk um does anybody have any questions for jane I do. unmute yourself go ahead jane so, and a comment too. So Jane, thank you so much for fleshing out somebody that I've heard about for years, but only had like sketchy ideas about. So um, that was really amazing. Uh, and one reason I think why we don't appreciate her or don't know about her as much is because she's from central New Jersey. As wonderful as the encyclopedia of New Jersey <clears throat> is, it was the brainchild of very eminent historians but they're centered in other places. Maxine Laurie had a very distinguished career at Seton Hall and the late Mark Mappin also associated with New Jersey historical. They don't have enough a sense of central New Jersey. So thank you so much for doing this. You gotta get the message out there about her contributions. I ran into a similar thing looking up Penelope Stout who's you know a little bit earlier, but the same deal. She wasn't mentioned in these New Jersey historical sources because they don't have the grasp on, uh, on, on central New Jersey. So this well, is- Well, central New Jersey doesn't exist. Yeah, some-, some <laughs> so, so Jane, the question I had for you was about um, Geraldine Thompson and her social life. So we know about all her philanthropic work. We know about her connections. Did she ever like socialize? Did she like go to parties and things? Because I always think of her just like working, working, working. Did you come across? Yeah, she, she actually entertained quite a bit and she would have parties, dinners at her, at Thompson Park, at the house, um, at Brookdale Farm. And she apparently had every governor between 1918 and 1957, every governor of the state of New Jersey was at a party at her house. Um, and uh, she used uh, social socializing and parties and dinner parties as ways to um, build political bridges. And so I, she was very social also personally with the people who lived around uh, Lincroft. So uh, Laura Harding, you may have heard of her. She uh, lived on Bayonet Farm on um, Middletown Road and uh, going towards like St. Catherine's Church over there. 
and Sunnyside Road in Lincroft. She had a big farm over there and she, they were very, very close friends. And uh, she also went to New York a lot. You know, she would go to Eleanor Roosevelt's apartment in New York and socialize with her. So she had, she rubbed elbows with some locals and she also was important, I think, even in the New York social scene with people like Eleanor Roosevelt and things like that. And, you know, I think that politics and, um, and socializing uh, kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so she was invited to the White House. She was invited to the White House many times by Hoover and by FDR. Uh, and so I think that uh, she did have an active social life. It seems that if you ever look her up in the local paper, she's always at some dinner. Uh, she's always at some dinner, some award ceremony, some scholarship ball, you know, she's always at all these things. You know, when you think about like junior league women, right? Women who are in like these good works organizations, they're always at some luncheon or, you know, something that has sort of quasi quasi good works and quasi uh, social parts to them. So yeah, I do think that she was social and, you know, was able to, uh, and she was actually supposedly very funny. She had a really, apparently a very good sense of humor. Almost everybody says that about her across the board that she was, had a very, very funny sense of humor and she could really make a, like if she was given a speech she would make the whole room laugh, you know, uh, you know, not always easy to do. <laughs> and the other thing that one last comment that I'll let other people chime in is that, that was absolutely fascinating was that she was the first woman appointed to a state board. Now, when you think of North Jersey and all the wealth and all those huge cities up there and nobody beat her to it from North Jersey, that is really amazing. You know, when there's sort of a story that goes with that, because um, the other woman who was up for the state board before she, when she got it, was Caroline Whitpen. Mm -hmm. And Caroline Whitpen was the daughter of Stevens Institute for Technology. Right. And she was supposed to get an appointment to the state board. And she crossed Frank Haig. Uh, okay. And Frank Haig kept her off. And so that was, uh, there was like sort of a story there, right? And at one point, um, somebody asks Geraldine Thompson, oh, you were the first woman appointed. She goes, well, I was supposed to be sec. I was not supposed to be, but Caroline, it should have been Caroline Whitpen, um, but that's the way it worked out. And so Caroline Whitpen, you know, gets appointed later, but it was sort of a political, um, a bit of a political snub. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Can you um, address the research? Be I know this because I was helping a student research Geraldine Thompson. Why it's hard to find things on Geraldine Thompson, the name Geraldine Thompson. It's harder. Well, you know, yeah. You know, it was much more common for women to be uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Lewis S. Thompson in in newspapers and being referred to that way. And for the most part, we see that all these women are referred to as Mrs. L. Thompson or, you know, things like that. And it took me a while to figure that out um, because I was having some problems finding things on her, but you kind of have to put your 19th century eyeballs on and think about how women were referred to in newspapers and how they refer to themselves. Um, even um, women who were friends would call each other uh, Mrs. Oh, hi, Mrs. Smith, how are you? You know, it was a very much, a much more formal society. Thank you. Welcome. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> two things. I love that whole thing of her feminist philosophy, Jane. That was amazing just to be women who we are and just do what comes naturally to us for the larger good. I thought that was beautiful. I just wanted to share, I come from India as you all know. There's one simple thing that happens in my culture. 
It doesn't matter what I become because of my education or my wealth or whatever. I have to be a good woman, meaning a good mother, a good wife, a good neighbor, a sister, a daughter, whatever. It doesn't matter. I may be a great professor. Who cares? You have to show that in all the other ways of womanhood. And when you were talking, that's what I was seeing. So she says, so, you know, I like how you distinguished the 20th century feminist. And, you know, people think of that as so different that they want to be like men. So she's saying, no, you don't have to do that. And that was very encouraging. I just wish everybody would hear that, like our students and our youngsters, right? They don't know that. They think that's outdated, that's, that's gone. But that I think is so important. That was one thing. And the other thing was, um, you know, uh, I see Maeve here, so nice to see her. She's with me in the global citizenship thing. She's graduating with a distinction this semester. We are struggling, right, to create environmental awareness and Look at how much she did more than 100 years ago, I'm thinking, right? Almost, almost. But to have that, um, she was rich. She need not have cared for the poor. But everything you said clearly tells us she was extraordinary. And I'm really sad, like when Judy and Jean are saying that people didn't know. I, I came to this presentation just to know who she is. What did she do that you would talk about her today? And I told Barbara yeah. Barella, come on, let's listen to this. This must be a good <laughs> session. <laughs> so thank you, Jane. That was oh, it. I welcome. mean, I have so much of notes, but uh, it really uh, spoke to me at a very personal level, you know? Yeah, I'm you know, she's, the more that I read about her, the more I come to admire her because she's so consistent her yeah. entire life. When you read things that she writes, when you read things that she says, she never changes. She always wants to help people. Mm -hmm. Somebody who needs help, she helps them. And she believed in goodness and love. She believes that the most important thing is love, that you have to love each other. And it really comes from this very deep spiritual place. Right. I think she's a very spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really came to admire that kind of selflessness in right. a sense, you know, that she really believes this, that she works so hard because she is extremely committed to helping people be healthy, to be safe, to not be mistreated or exploited. And so she really dedicates her life to that. And um, it's really clear when you, when you see her long career, it's not like she just does something for a little while. Mm -hmm it up or does something else or whatever. Um, but she's really committed to these ideas. Like I said, the, uh, the New Jersey history book that I was reading talks about these four main things, right? Like child reform, prison reform, right. environmental issues. She stays interested in those four things for 40 years she works for them. And so she is really a perfect example of that. And she lived during the first environmental movement, right? So the first environmental, we think of the environmentalism of the 70s and things. Yeah. There was one earlier, right? In the like Teddy Roosevelt and in the creation of the national parks in the 1880s. That's when she's coming of age. Mm -hmm. She really continues to have this enormous uh, appreciation for, the, for nature, she lives in nature, she loves the farm. She goes, we have to be, live with nature. We have to go out and look at the trees and the birds and we have to appreciate the natural world. And so she really carries that all the way through all her work and her generosity. I can't imagine the value of the land she gave away in New York on the Hudson Valley and in, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, she gives her own personal wealth away. So she walks the walk. And I just wanted to say, I have done a lot of my doctoral work at the Bellevue Hospital. Oh. So much, so much of my doctoral work was done at Bellevue. And I don't know, and I'm rusty now, this is a long time ago. I, I believe I have seen her name somewhere there as like how Mae was taking your class and doing this. I was just asking her, well, how come you came to this? 
they were telling us, I'm not sure, but I think it was definitely asking us to go and find out about Geraldine, but it was such a long time ago, I, I don't remember. So when you were talking, and you know, all that stuff about separating the men from women who were in, I mean, that's so traumatic to begin with, right? And then to live in those circumstances, I can't even imagine what that was like, so. Or how about you're a poor kid who's an orphan or, you know, a juvenile delinquent or something, and you get thrown in with mentally ill people, prisoners, I mean, to, to, for a child. Yeah. Uh, they really just, they wouldn't stop working until these institutions were separated uh, and become more humane. There was no humane treatment. So, so it, how, am I understanding that she is never taught in, in history, in the schools, in the textbooks? No one knows about her? Is that what I'm learning now? That's a shame, really. There, no, there's, there's, there's no yeah. book on her. I mean, Except least, for the one yeah. that Jane's going to write. Yeah. <laughs> no, at least a chapter about, you know, because she should never be for, and it's a role model, right, for, for young girls. Uh, just listening to her life. I'm inspired. We are all inspired. We're thinking, oh, we're ready to retire. No, no, keep going. You know? And Ra, okay. she's been under, she's been here under my nose for 28 years, right? And I'm kind of just coming to appreciate even yeah is teaching women's history at Brookdale. Now I'm looking at her, you know, after all this time. The passion is just so, so great. Oh, passion. I, I, I'm really touched, you know, it inspired me a lot. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. It's nice to hear good stories about good people. She does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jane, if, if I may, can you hear me? Yes. I, I always look for new material to use in my class. And I struggle to find new material for my class on pro the progressive movement. But here I have an incredibly progressive example that's literally under my nose that my students certainly should be able to identify with uh, for any number of reasons. So I thank you for bringing it to my attention. You have made an, a very nice contribution to my teaching efforts. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for saying that. And uh, she, she really is, you know, when you, when, uh, when you look at her lifetime of work for free, <laughs> I mm -hmm. know, uh, think of that enough, uh, that she just was, um, you know, really a product of that time, of all the activists at that time who were trying to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially, you know, especially protecting children and helping children. Anyone I else? Have any uh, raising nine kids in that house and her husband's off shooting ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments for us? Uh, just so you know, the, the book that was mentioned, A Triangle of Land, is actually online. You can actually get it. A PDF of it online. Um, so it talks about Brookdale Community College, but it's, uh, it's virtual. We also have copies in the, in the Bankier library okay. as well. So um, if you ever want to look at that, um, it might be fun to look at. So well, Thompson Park takes on a new meaning for us, right? When right. I, I never knew. <laughs> Thompson Park. Yeah, some Thompson Park. <laughs> and you can so, tour the house. I think it's open um, I checked the website the other day, it may be reopened, um, now that you can actually tour it. Um, it was in a fire mm -hmm. and then rebuilt, um, after the fire. So, um, you know, it's always a place to go and look. And, um, if you've never been to, I think everybody here is a Brookdale person, but there's lots of history, all the buildings, the farm buildings and things, you know, but, um, we really appreciate Jane, you coming. One of the, uh, if there's any positive related to this pandemic, it's that I've, uh, the library has started these little lectures that we can do on Zoom and I'm going to continue that moving forward. So, um, you know, engage, uh, having our faculty come and talk about different topics and things like that of interest, I think is gonna be uh, really good. And um, so, 
That's it. Somebody has a question. Thanks, to Judy, to yeah. you too. Judy, this was great. Thanks for organizing this for us. Hello, Jane. Yeah. Pat. Hi, Pat. Um, during the time that she lived there, was there any involvement with the Underground Railroad since she was, went to the Republican convention in uh, Cleveland? And they had the plantation, Lee's plantation down there in Georgia. Did she have any uh, secret room there in that big house for the Underground Railroad <laughs> coming through from south to north? I think I the times think match. The other side being a Republican, no? I think that the, the house was built after the Civil War, so I don't think um, it existed uh -huh. um, when the Underground Railroad was in, you know, in operation. Right. Or Harriet Pedman, uh, she was born in 1815. Mm. She was born in 1872. Hey, fun. And her father-in-law built the house mm. in uh, the 1890s. So was there any slavery it, on that land during that time? Not by the Thompsons, uh, but before, oh. and the Withers, uh, Withers uh, owned that land. I don't know beforehand. Um, there was, a, you know, she does, there's a, a bit of the story I wasn't able to talk about tonight, but she does um, insist that there is a school for the seasonal workers there, mm. be the stable boys, the 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 men, the young men who exercise the horses every day, mm -hmm. and were uh, involved with taking care of the horses on the farm, were young African American men, and she insists that they have a school, and she raises the money, she she hires the teacher. And she makes them have school in the afternoon. Um, so she was very attuned to um, the African American men who were working there in relation to the horse uh, training facility. She mm -hmm. also raised money for African American scholarships in the 1950s. She calls mm. it a scholarship. She worked with the Black Women's Clubs to create a scholarship she funded the scholarship uh, okay. for african-american uh new jersey high school graduates to go to cornell oh. and uh so she was she was uh definitely interested especially in scholarships and education in um working with uh, african-americans in in the state of new jersey yeah, I was kind of wondering because of the Red Oak Hill, isn't that part of Indian, Indian family lived over there on the other side of Thompson Park going through Middletown, Red Oak Hill farms over that way? I don't know. You know, there's a big map that the, the Monmouth County uh, Park System has just put in a big application to be considered a national historic landmark. Yeah. And their application includes very extensive, not only just, not just narrative, which I actually took some from their narrative for my presentation, but they also have all maps uh, over time of the land and the, uh, and Lincroft and the area around it. And um, I am not sure. Okay. It might be on there though. Okay. Um. Anybody else? In the area. Yeah. Does anybody else have any? Well, thank you uh, for, uh, for helping me. Pat was very helpful in getting yes. some things. I appreciate all your help in uh, making this research possible. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, they do. We did have, we do have an archive at Brookdale and there is a file of things on Geraldine Thompson in the Brookdale archives. Um, so, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This has been really great. And um, this will be recorded. So as soon as I get the link, I will send it out to the world. It'll be on the Brookdale YouTube channel. Um, so you can get it there as well. And um, if you have any suggestions for topics for uh, the library to have a lecture on, you can always email me and I'll put it in the chat. Um, 
you can see why I wanted to have Jane come um, after I heard it the first time, because I, I just thought everybody needs to know about um, th this uh, wonderful person named Geraldine Thompson. So thank you so much for coming. And um, this is my email address. If you would like to, um, you know, have any guest speakers or you know somebody that you think would be good for us to know about um, for our, our library lectures that um, I'd like to keep going with, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much for coming and uh, we'll see you the next one. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank Jane you. And Judy okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.